The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We'll get started in another minute or two. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you all for able to join us today. Uh, this is our fourth in the uh, Better Plans online learning series. This one's called Resources You Should Know. I know I'm particularly excited for this one, where we're featuring some of our colleagues across the federal family at the United States Department of Agriculture, Rural uh, Development Programs, and the Department of Commerce, Manufacturing, Extension Partnership Centers. So, next slide. That's me, Eli Levine. I do these little introductions before we hand it off to the presenters each week. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, as you can see, this is our fourth in the online learning series. If you happen to have missed any of the first three, the initial town hall where we had our partners talking about uh, the COVID response and some updates that we've offered in terms of uh, from better plants, some new resources and tools that we hope you'll take advantage of. Um, and uh, if you happen to miss that or the first, the next two that we had, the basics of energy or lighting, HV and AC and the building envelope, um, they're all online on our website uh, where you can watch the recording and go back and catch up. Uh, we have two more scheduled after this focused on compressed air systems and water efficiency. And uh, based on the response we've been hearing from so many of your partners, we may well can keep uh, this going in the future for additional weeks to come. So should, as always, and I made this, uh, uh, pitch last week too. If there's specific topics you want to hear, or are there ways that we can improve these webinars to make them more valuable to, uh, to you, please let us know, and we're, we're happy to do so. Um, so with that, I'm excited to turn this over, and I'll introduce our first speaker. Oh, well, I guess before that, let me talk about our um, next. So next slide, I'll talk about our online uh, virtual leadership symposium, the Better Buildings, Better Plans 2020 Summit. Um, this is now free to attend, unlike uh, when we used to have them in person and you had to pay for registration. It should be a really great couple of days. I know I've been uh, really blown away by the number of folks who've RSVP'd already and I'm pretty excited looking at the plenary uh, speakers and the panels that we're setting up. So uh, please go to the website there and register if you can. Uh, that would be great. We, we look forward to seeing you there. Next slide. So with that, I'm excited to uh, introduce our first speaker uh, uh, David Steering, who's the division chief for the extension services at the uh, the national uh, the NIST MEP at the U.S. Department of uh, the, the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Steering's a mechanical engineer who's been with NIST MEP uh, since 2007. Uh, prior to joining NIST MEP, he served 20 years, uh, you know, in the NIST laboratories as a research engineer, a pro project manager, and a program manager. Um, he, he brings just really wonderful experience to this, you know, working. Uh, on details on the staff of the NIST director and the uh, staff of the Office of the Secretary of Defense in the Pentagon, as well as uh, at, at our place, at the Department of Energy and at the U.S. Small Business Association. So uh, I could go on and on with his, uh, uh, his resume and the experiences he brings to this, but I know he's squeezing us in between a number of important uh, meetings that they have going on over there. So I'm excited to turn this over to, to David, to Dave, uh, and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Eli. I appreciate that intro. Um, so, folks, good afternoon. It's a it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you about uh, th this afternoon about the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program at NIST. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and we're an agency within the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, NIST is a non-regulatory federal agency that has responsibilities for the nation's measurement infrastructure. And the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or MEP, program uh, is one component of NIST, and that's what I'm going to be speaking with you about today. So, Marissa, next slide, please. So, I'm going to give you a little bit of an intro, folks, about what the MEP uh, program is, how we operate our national network, 
uh, why we exist, what we do. And then really I'm gonna focus on how the MEP uh, National Network is responding to um, the needs of U.S. manufacturers uh, today uh, with respect to our national emergency, including uh, both the response that we're, we're conducting as well as the work that we're doing to help manufacturers prepare for recovery from this national emergency. So folks, in one slide, this is what the MEP National Network is. We're a non-federal, um, the, the, the program is a public-private partnership that has local flexibility and is based upon uh, an extension model. And by an extension model, what that means is that um, we at NIST MEP are the federal program managers for the MEP program. And we operate a national network of non-federal assistance centers that are located in all 50 U.S. states and Puerto Rico. There's one center in every state and out of every, uh, and out of every one of our centers, we have multiple service locations. So the companies that are manufacturing product in the United States are within a two hour drive of a point of uh, point of service from an MEP center. I mentioned that it's uh, you know an extension model. So um, the primary manufacturing companies that are served by the MEP centers are small to medium-sized companies, as defined by the SBA as fewer than 500 employees at a particular location. And the reason why the MEP program was set up to address the technical needs of these companies is that there's basically a market failure that was first identified in the 1980s and persists today with respect to the U.S. economy and manufacturers. When you look at the demographics of manufacturers, 99% of the roughly 300,000 manufacturing establishment is, establishments that exist in the U.S. are in fact small companies. And most of these companies do not have access to the technical expertise and the other resources that they need to be able to ensure that they're implementing the most state-of-the-art technologies into their operations and that they have the resources that they need to be able to compete on a global basis. So our centers are, um, they, we, have no, we have no super centers. And when we talk about centers, we're not talking about centers of excellence or R&D entities. Uh, these are basically um, sanity, centers that, that solve real problems uh, typically short-term problems of companies by working with those companies in their factories on a daily basis. Essentially, we're a nationwide consultancy, um, but we're a consultancy that's a public good consultancy that specifically tailors its services to the needs of small companies. We have no super centers. Our centers very typically leverage partners uh, to a great extent to maximize their service offerings so that any manufacturer anywhere in the country that has any need can have its need be met by an MEP center. If you look up in the upper right-hand corner by the numbers, um, our MEP centers receive uh, $146 million um, from this MEP in fiscal year 20. Um, the federal investment in the program is matched by our MEP centers. So when our centers actually go into manufacturing companies and conduct projects, typically the projects um, are, are conducted on a fee-for-service basis. Now, a lot of the services that our centers do provide to companies don't involve any exchange of funding, but when our centers are actually in uh, factories conducting projects that take you know, anywhere from eight hours up to, uh, you know, eight weeks or, or eight months, uh, typically the, the companies will reimburse our centers for their, um, for their time. In addition, I want to make sure that folks are aware that uh, MEP received $50 million in conjunction with the CARES Act, uh, and that funding is now going out to our centers uh, to, uh, to help our centers be able to provide manufacturers with the services that they now need in the face of drastically reduced markets uh, to basically help companies stay afloat. Also, um, the funding, the federal funding that goes out because it's cost shared, part of the CARES Act uh, stipulations as well as that cost share waivers are in fact in place. So MEP centers um, for the remainder of FY20 are in fact offering their services without any need for cost share. 
So once again, down in the lower right, we're an extension-based program. We transfer technology and expertise to manufacturers. Next slide. So when you look at the national landscape of the MEP program, here's an example of what our centers look like in every state. I should highlight here that when you look at the logos and the names of the centers that exist in the states, in some instances you see the word MEP and in others you don't. Here's the reason for that. These are all the MEP centers, but our MEP centers are very closely woven into the economic development fabric of the state in which they operate. And very typically, uh, there's, there's certain name or brand recognition associated with certain entities within a particular state. So if you look, for example, over in California, CMTC, our center in California is the California Manufacturing Technology Consulting Organization. And that is an entity that has been around for a long time, uh, and there is brand recognition associated with that. That is the MEP center, but we don't require that the word MEP be in the name, simply that when a center operates, uh, it does so with full recognition that it's operating as part of the MEP national network. Then if you come over and you look, for example, in Georgia, you see that the Georgia MEP is in fact called that Georgia MEP. Uh, one thing that I'll mention about the business structure of our centers, about half of our 51 centers operate as 501c3 nonprofits. Of the remaining half, about two-thirds of them are actually located in parts of universities. And when I say parts of universities, they're very typically in either the extension services part of a university or the economic development aspect of a university. Uh, and of the remaining one third of that half that are not nonprofits, they're in state government agencies. So if you look in Ohio, for example, our Ohio MEP is part of the Ohio Developing Servicing Agency, which is part of the Ohio state government. Next slide. By the numbers, um, 51 centers. Out of our 51 centers, we have about 1,400 manufacturing experts. These are people that are um, engineers, technical manufacturing experts that are in factories every day around the country. Very typically, these are people that um, you know have a long, long amount of manufacturing experience. A lot of them are plant owner, plant managers. Many of them are small business owners that are now giving back in this public good based program. Out of our 51 centers, we also operate about 375 service locations around the country to give us that geographic coverage that I mentioned early on. And then in addition, because none of our centers are um, uh, super centers, we work closely with over 2,000 uh, service providers and partners that help us extend the range of the uh, portfolio of services that any and all of our centers can provide. Along the lines of, of per service providers and partners, one of the things that is the most powerful attribute of the MEP National Network is that our centers work together. So if a, if a manufacturer in a particular state has a need that the center in that state can't meet, they'll go to a neighboring center or they'll go to one of our go-to centers that has that expertise resident and that, um, that neighboring center or that go-to center will come into the other state and help meet the need of the particular manufacturing client. Next slide. So it, a program is based on partnership. The P and MEP stands for, for partnership. We work closely with a lot of federal agencies and laboratories, including the DOE, uh, <clears throat> including the Department of Defense. A lot of stuff that we do in cybersecurity right now, we do closely with uh, the Department of Defense. Um, you know, with respect to the DOE, um, one aspect of services that we provide are process optimization, uh, lean manufacturing. And, you know, when we do lean uh, manufacturing, we very often do it from a, a lean and clean or a lean and green perspective. And a lot of times we work closely with the uh, industrial assessment centers that the DOE operates. Um, you heard me say earlier that our centers are tightly woven into the economic development fabric of states. So very closely, you know, our centers work with uh, state governments. Uh, in today's national crisis, our centers work closely with um, state, state health departments, with governor's offices, and are really viewed as that go-to resource within, the, within a particular state. Um, for access to manufacturers. You heard me say that, you know, we're, we're part of economic development. 
we work with a lot of third party economic development organizations, um, many of which are international, by the way. We also do a lot of work with community colleges, technical schools, a lot of the stuff that we do involves training and, and a lot of times we'll refer clients to training courses and, that are available through community colleges and technical schools. And we also do work with universities when there are technical aspects of the work that we do and it makes sense for us to partner with universities. In addition, we do a lot of work with industry leaders, think tanks, trade, trade associations and other partners because when we serve the needs of small manufacturers, very typically those needs are as parts of supply chains and it's important for us to have relationships and know what's happening up and down throughout supply chains to best serve the, the needs of, of manufacturers that are, that are operating in you know, third, fourth, even fifth tiers of supply chains. Next slide. So by the numbers, this is my one cheerleading slide, folks, but I want you to see how impactful this, this $146 million federal program is on a national uh, basis annually. So these are numbers that in, in fiscal 2019, our MEP national network across the country, uh, we served over 28,000 US manufacturers. When we conduct projects with those companies, and typically we conduct about nine or 10,000 projects annually, we have a third party um, survey process that, that we use that's independent, that goes to the clients that we serve and asks the clients to report data to us that describe, that detail the impact of the services that our centers provide to them. Based upon uh, the, the project uh, survey results from 2019 alone, MEP center services for small manufacturers across the country resulted in almost 115,000 jobs being either created or retained at those companies. $15.7 billion in new and retained sales for those companies, about $4.5 billion in total investment uh, by those companies into their businesses, and about a billion and a half dollars in cost savings. So folks, when you look at these numbers, you know, for $146 million federal investment, this is a very impactful national program for the U.S. economy and specifically for the manufacturing sector of our economy. Next slide. So how do our centers work with clients? There's no cookie cutter approach, but if I break it down into a, a common theme, basically our centers have contact with companies and that contact can occur through a lot of different mechanisms. It can be web-based marketing. It can be group lunch and learns. It can be webcasts. It can be you know word of mouth referrals. It can be companies one at a time or companies by the hundreds. After the initial contact, um, there, there's, there's typically a discussion that occurs about a topic. Once that discussion occurs, our centers will then do an assessment of a manufacturer uh, that will um, basically detail what the manufacturer is doing and where they might need to get to, and that will identify any potential issues uh, that can lead to a, a defined project approach, um, you know, and and um, a means by which gaps can be closed and strategies can be capitalized on. A center will then negotiate with the client whether they actually want to proceed forward and address, uh, you know, what the center identifies as opportunities, um, you know, to solve problems or, uh, you know, capitalize on, on new growth opportunities or new business opportunities. And then our centers will, will execute a project uh, that will involve either center staff, partners, or third-party consultants, or some combination of all of those. And typically, MEP center projects for companies can be as small as a couple of hours or as long as a year, depending upon the nature of the technical work that we're doing. And then, as I mentioned, we always have follow-up where we go back uh, on, through an independent third party and ask the manufacturers to tell us about the impacts of the work that we did for them. In the middle there, you see the net promoter score. That's an aggregate number um, that is used as a, uh, a representative of if a manufacturer would refer the MEP center to a friend or family member. And typically a net promoter score of 50 or above is considered very good. An aggregate score of 85 is considered excellent across the national network. Next slide. 
every year when we ask our clients about the impact of the work that we do for them, we also ask them what their challenges are. And I just put this up here so that you're aware that among the nation's small manufacturers that we serve, cost reduction is an ongoing and ever-present issue. These were identified during our 2019 uh, client impact survey. Uh, workforce is always uh, always there. Clients seeking to grow, uh, manufacturing companies seeking to grow. Product development issues are uh, are ever present as are sustainability issues. And I'll give you some details about things that we do with respect to sustainability. Next slide, please. So what do our centers actually do? Uh, this is not uh, exclusive, excuse me, this is not all inclusive, but this is representative of the types of technical assistance that we offer to companies. I'll start with sustainability. We've had a long standing um, program that works closely with the Department of Energy and with the EPA, uh, looking at uh, energy, uh, the environment, and the economy, or E3. And what we do as part of that program and in conjunction with our, uh, you know, process optimization activities and ISO and quality work that we do is we help companies identify how they can drive waste out of their manufacturing processes, including energy and emissions related waste. That's a, uh, that's a common program across our MEP national network. In addition, we do a lot of things relating to cybersecurity, how do companies uh, put in place the protections that they need to protect their online and information-based assets. Uh, Lean and, and the next evolution of Lean, Toyota Kata, that's a, you know, that's a core competency across the national network. Workforce development is, is something that's ever present. You know, how do companies uh, attract and retain and, retain and retrain, uh, you know, the workforce that they need? Industry 4.0 and advanced manufacturing technology is a very hot topic for us today. How do companies better connect the cyber and physical uh, systems that are part of their manufacturing environments to, uh, to make their products better, cheaper, and faster, and more innovative? We help companies export. Um, you know, we help companies with risk mitigation. We do a lot of work in the food industry, um, folks, where we help food companies um, you know, to, to, to put in place safe food manufacturing practices. And I also want to highlight that, you know, here um, we address basically every industry within the manufacturing sector, whether it's uh, energy products manufacturers or chemical manufacturers or food companies, uh, defense contractors, transportation manufacturers, metal workers, whatever. Literally, if it's uh, companies that have NAICS codes, that begin with 3132 or 33, uh, they're, they're in scope for the work that we do. One thing other also that I wanna highlight here is that this broad portfolio has really positioned MEP centers to be able to respond very well to the current uh, national emergency that we're facing. And I'll give you some info in the coming slides about what we're doing there. Next slide. So what are we doing right now in the, with respect to the national emergency? Folks, our centers are on the front lines right now. They are responding immediately to help small manufacturers um, stay afloat. You know, the, the, the markets are shrinking. A lot of companies have excess capacities and capabilities and they want to pitch in and help. So there's really four main areas where um, our, our, our centers are, are working to help companies um, as well as help the overall um, U.S. national needs with respect to PPE, medical equipment, and supplies. But our response really boils down to connecting resources to needs, working directly with state governments, addressing, addressing specific production and technology issues with manufacturing of PPE, medical supplies, and medical devices. And then while we're doing all of this, just basically maintaining base operations and serving all manufacturers whether those companies are responding to the national emergency or not. And as I mentioned earlier, we got a slug of $50 million through CARES Act funding that's helping us do this. Next slide, please. So quickly, I wanna highlight the four areas. We're connecting resources to needs. I'm not gonna reach, I'm not gonna read all of these words, but we're doing things associated with supply chain mapping. Where do, where do suppliers exist that can meet critical PPE needs? How can we match resources uh, to needs in medical, medical and food supply chains? 
you know, what are what are manufacturers that have capabilities and capacities that are not currently operating in these supply chains, but that can pivot to do that? How are we connecting with our state government partners and agencies to operate supply chain portals? And a lot of MEP centers are, in fact, doing that. And then, you know, how what are we doing as far as workforce and, and what are the, the workforce issues associated with this and then and then partnering with federal agencies? Next slide. With respect to uh, working directly with state governments, again, MEP centers are really being positioned right now as the go-to central hub within many states for uh, accessing um, the, the, the production and manufacturing capacity and base within states to meet both state-based needs uh, and um, you know, national needs overall. Uh, and, and one of the things that's cool that we're doing is serving as a connection between the manufacturing industry and state procurement efforts, uh, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, you're managing this supply chain, these portals that are linking manufacturers to demand uh, for the, 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 the present uh, critical, critically needed and short supply items. Next slide. I want to give you two slides that talk about the process that we're using to help make these connections, and they're called MEP supplier scouting. And really, what we're doing is is serving in a, in a in a pivotal uh, connection point where our centers know the capabilities of manufacturers in their state, and they're working either with state-based entities or national entities to connect manufacturing capabilities and capacities with national and market needs um, and uh, do this either on a national scale or, or on, a, on a state scale. This helps solve the problems of you know, the critically needed and short supply items, plus it biz brings business to companies. The other thing that's very cool about this is we're not just making a connection and walking away, we're making a connection and then we're helping companies go through the process of what is the strategy for how they're going to pivot and retool their operations and scale up. Next slide. So supplier scouting, um, you know, it, it, we can do this within a week. Um, you know, we identify a need and we can go out and conduct an analysis on a state level or on a, on a national level and give a high fidelity of results that are companies that can meet needs and we can give answers within one week and that's very quick. Uh, and we're proud of the fact that we can do that. And the key to our success here is our national network, not the tools that we're utilizing, but the fact that we have this national network with a presence in every state and this deep and broad understanding of manufacturing capabilities. Next slide. The next area that we're doing to uh, you know, address is we're, we're, we're addressing specific issues with the manufacturer of PPE uh, you know, medical supplies and medical devices. And, you know, we're helping companies go through the process of certification when they need it. Uh, you know, we're helping them enter new markets when they don't understand how to do that. Uh, you know, a lot of things, um, you know, have to do with legal liabilities and, and we're helping companies go through the process for products that include gloves, face shield, you know, masks, um, catheters, you know, medical supplies, uh, oxygen mass, nasal, uh, you know, cannulas, uh, and then different types of devices, including beds, infusion pumps, uh, you know, pressure rooms and, and the like. And there you see a listing of the different types of devices and supplies that we're focused on right now. Next slide. And then lastly, it's important to mention that it's, it's not just about helping companies respond to the national emergency, but it's also about helping companies continue to stay afloat as, um, you know, their, their markets are shrinking and they're not yet ready to pivot into new markets, but how do we uh, work with companies to, <clears throat> to help them access capital that they need through loans for the SBA, um, SBA loan programs that are out there right now? How do we help them get lines of credit and cash? You know, what do we do? Uh, what are the different approaches that they can take to protect their workforce and their workplace? Uh, you know, a lot of things have to do with OSHA requirements and social distancing. How do companies stay, a, stay afloat and operate in a way that's safe for their employees? We're helping companies go through those processes. Um, you know, we're helping companies examine and stabilize their own supply chains. How are they engaging companies now, our customers now? 
they're, they're not they're not doing so in person and shaking hands anymore. You know, what are the online means by which manufacturers can operate supply chains? Uh, and then, folks, right now, cybersecurity is really taking on a new level of prominence with respect to risk management for manufacturers overall. Next slide. Next slide, please. And folks, that's really it for my overview presentation of MEP, how, who we are, what we do, and how we operate, and what we're doing in response to the, uh, to the national crisis. And my last message to you, you know, we're a viable national partner. We're a federal-private uh, partnership. Uh, you know, we connect with manufacturer needs one at a time and on a national scale, and we do that by the hundreds and thousands at a time, uh, both in, in immediate and direct response to the national emergency, as well as perhaps, uh, you know, and, and equally as importantly as in preparation for recovery from the national emergency. There's my contact info. Uh, I'm, I'm available to answer any questions either via email. You can give me a call. Uh, there's our website. And uh, Marissa or Eli, I don't know if we have time for any questions right now, but I'll pause at this point and turn it back over to either you, Eli, or you, Marissa. Uh, thanks, Dave. This was really awesome. I, every time I, I think I start to have a handle on all the great stuff you're doing, I sit and listen to a presentation and learn so much more. So uh, just on behalf of you know all of us, just thank you guys for the, the important role you're playing now and, and in general supporting you know our, our manufacturing competitiveness. So it's, it's 131, Dave, so maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, one question. If, if anyone has a question, please type it in. But maybe I'll, like, I'll, I'll see one question we got, and then uh, I know you do have to uh, jet off to another meeting. So I appreciate you leaving your contact information. Um, so a question we got is if their um, if you know if their company was thinking you know thinking of reaching out to a, to the MEP network to see how an MEP could help them. Is it best off reaching out to uh, to you? To you directly, Dave, to start thinking about uh, uh, how they could work with MEP, or the, should they reach out and contact their local MEP in their state? What's the best way to work with the MEP network? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, this MEP, uh, myself, um, great place to start. Um, can can help uh, you know a company understand what options are. Um, but the way that we operate as a program is I'm happy to have, uh, you know, an initial engagement to, to understand what the company's needs or opportunities are. But the actual hands-on technical assistance that will be available to any company anywhere in the country will, in fact, be through their local manu uh, manufacturing extension partnership center. And the way that they can access uh, the contact info for their center is through the website here, www.nest.gov slash MEP. And if you go on that website and look at the national network, there's the means by which you can uh, contact your local MEP center, uh, and it'll give you access to every MEP center in the, in the country there. Uh, wonderful. Uh, wonderful. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, if, if they're built, if they're, uh, if their business is located in more than one state, should they? Uh, do you advise that they start with one state and see uh, how that MEP center can help, and then uh, maybe look to a connection and uh, and then you know build the build the conversation with with another MEP in the, in the neighboring state? Yes, absolutely. That is that is a viable option, and that's something that we encounter very frequently. And in a situation like that. Um, you know, it's it's not a bad idea to to start with a connection at NIST at NIST MEP. Um, but you know, again, e even if it's an instance where there are multiple locations, the actual assistance is going to occur via the local MEP centers, plural in this instance. Uh, so that that reference will ultimately be made regardless of the particular need. Oh, fantastic. Well, with that, uh, I'm sure there are other questions, but we do want to be respectful of your time. So thank you for leaving your, your contact information up there. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to join us and uh, uh, for everything that you guys are doing. So, uh, Dave, I, I will let you go and return to your other meeting, and we will uh, turn to our next presenter. Um, thanks again, Dave. So this is, uh, this is uh, Venus, Welch, uh, Venus Welch Wright. She serves as the National Rural Energy Program Coordinator at USDA's Rural Business Cooperative Service. 
Um, she has a really cool job in reading about this. In her current role, she uh, conducts stakeholder engagement, outreach, business strategy and development, policy support, and facilitates collaborations with internal and external uh, partners in agriculture, energy, biofuels, business development, and financial institutions. Um, she joined uh, USDA as a presidential management fellow, which is uh, uh, also how I joined uh, the Department of Energy, so I'm, I'm partial to that. She has a BS, uh, Bachelor of Science in Biology, a Master's and a Doctorate uh, in Integrative Biosciences from Tuskegee University in Alabama. So Venus, uh, thank you for, for joining us uh, while juggling all the responsibilities you have, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Great, thanks Eli, thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, so again, um, Venus Wolf White uh, with Rural Development, Rural Business and Cooperative Services. Um, so I'm going to just kick off that um, how I got to know Eli is actually through uh, USDA um, Department of Energy Memorandum of Understanding, which was a part of the 2018 Farm Bill um, and was announced last October. So we've been really working uh, diligently and happy to be here. And thank you so much, Eli, for the invitation um, to participate in this webinar. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to always start off with kind of people that don't know USDA. Um, it is a massive organization. Um, it includes uh, over 17 different agencies across seven mission areas, lots of offices. And so um, just in lieu of time, I'm not going to read this, um, but we have a major footprint. And so I always try to kind of start high level um, just in the standpoint of how large USDA is and a lot of resources um, that we are able to offer uh, through a variety of, um, of missions and agencies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm with Rural Development, and again, we are a mission area um, that primarily serves to assist rural communities in creating prosperity, so they're self-sustaining and economically thriving um, through our investments that create less ladders of opportunity, um, be, builds resilience, and supports the growth of emerging markets. Um, under the RD umbrella, we actually have three separate agencies, Rural Housing Service, Rural Utility Service, and again, Rural Cooperative, uh, Rural Business and Cooperative Service, which is what I'm a part of. Next slide, please. And the fantastic thing about RD is that we have approximately, don't quote me on this, 40 different funding programs. Um, and so we have a lot of different resources um, across our three sister agencies. Um, but for the sake of this particular um, presentation, I'm going to um, primarily highlight six, which is a lot of, a lot of um, programs. Um, across our two different funding agencies. I'm going to talk just briefly about community facilities, our business and industry guaranteed loan program, our intermediary relending program, um, our rural business development grant, our REAP, Rural Energy for America um, program, our biorefinery, renewable chemical and bio-based product manufacturing, as well as our bio-based product program. So this is kind of just a snippet of the types of programs that we offer. Next slide, please. Um, just to kind of paint, uh, we offer, again, a multitude of programs that support rural business growth. Um, we have uh, programs that can assist with capital needs, education, entrepreneurial skills, I apologize, um, and our public-private partnership. Um, in FY19, we in invested in approximately uh, $2 billion across our guaranteed loan programs. Um, and again, this is really to support prosperity. As we pause here for a moment, just a reminder to uh, type in your questions, and we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to answer them at the uh, at the end of the webinar. So sorry about that. So our bio-based uh, markets is our bio-preferred program. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with this. It doesn't necessarily fit into any of our funding programs, but I thought I would take time just to mention it. Um, it is a two-part labeling and procurement program, um, and it moved from departmental management to rural development under the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, and it has a renewable chemical provision, um, as well as some consolidated provisions. So um, if anybody has any questions about that, feel free to reach out and I can provide you some additional information on that particular program. Next slide, please. 
So our 9007 program, our Rural Energy for America program, is probably one of our flagship programs. Um, it provides uh, grants and guaranteed loan funding um, through commercially available renewable energy systems, as well as energy efficiency improvements for ag producers and rural small businesses. Um, just for in 2019, we awarded approximately $250 million um, to approximately 14 um, hundred pro, uh, different types of projects. Um, so we have about $500 million available in guaranteed loans. I don't think that number is, I think we probably use some of that. And we had approximately $40 million in grants this particular year. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's important to note that we only do energy, uh, commercially available technology. So from an efficiency perspective, we really consider anything old to new, um, lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, fans, automated controls, um, insulations, we can do HVAC systems, we can do combined heat and power. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in the standpoint of the types of program or types of um, projects um, that can be done with our REAP uh, funds. Um, as far as our renewable energy system installations, again, anything commercially available technology, um, we are technology agnostic. So solar, wind, um, hydro, electric, digesters, waste energy projects, biomass, geothermal, as well as wave and ocean power. So um, there's a lot of opportunity in the same point, the types of energy efficiency or renewable energy system installations that um, we are able to uh, provide for this particular program. Next slide, please. Um, so for our grants, um, we are able to do approximately set, uh, a maximum of 25% of our total eligible project cost. Um, the deadline for this particular year uh, ended on March 30th. However, we accept applications year round. Um, one thing to note, uh, we have priority for proper um, programs, I'm sorry, for applications or projects that um, the grant request is for 20,000 and less. Um, those are, we actually have some set aside funds and so those projects, those smaller projects don't compete with the larger projects. Um, and the application deadline, priority deadline, at least one of them is October 30th. So um, if anybody's interested, um, we can definitely um, get some information on kind of teeing up what that looks like. Um, our maximum grant request for our renewable energy systems is 500,000, um, which would mean a total eligible project cost of 2 million. Um, and then for our energy efficiency improvements, um, our maximum uh, grant request is $250,000, um, which would be a total eligible project cost of a million dollars. Um, so again, that's just kind of highlighting, um, and it can be anything in between the, four, the 1,500 all the way up to um, the 250 um, for, for the efficiency improvements, and then obviously um, a minimum of $2,500 all the way up to the 500,000 for the um, renewable energy system installation. Next slide, please. Um, rural our Rural Business Development Grant um, is a program that's designed to provide technical assistance and training for uh, rural small businesses. Um, and typically we're talking about a, a business that has fewer than 50 workers or less than a million dollars in gross revenue. Um, I mentioned this and I was really thinking about um, our partners that do the wastewater treatment potentially, um, that this may be an opportunity for trying to do some expansion. Um, actually, even in the manufacturing side, if you're doing some expansion and you would have a need for maybe looking at the development grant. Um, and it's a combination grant and loan program. Next slide, please. Um, there are two different types of support. There's an enterprise grant um, that's more training and technical assistance, project planning, um, business consulting, um, feasibility studies. Um, and then there's an opportunity grant that supports kind of analyze uh, business opportunities. Um, again, these are um, the primary applicant would actually be a nonprofit. Um, and would probably need to partner with another entity. So um, if anybody has any questions on this, we can definitely, um, I can provide some links um, post, um, but just kind of wanted to put this out here that we do have some um, development grants um, as businesses are trying to expand. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna shift into our loan programs. Um, again, we provide uh, direct loans as well as loan guarantees under um, various programs within our three agencies. Um, for our loan programs, any guaranteed loan program that the bank is actually our applicant, um, which could be um, a credit union, farm service agency, and an approval lender, um, community banks, large banks, and so we um, we kind of evaluate the banks. But again, the lender is our is our applicant. Um, the interest rates and repayment terms are negotiated between the borrower and the lender with our concurrence. Um, and typically eligible projects are located in a rural area defined by the program. Um, I will mention when we're talking about rural, and I apologize for not mentioning this earlier, 
it's any population of 50,000 or less based off of the census um, data. And so we do have a rule determination um, on our website. Um, and I would say one important note is that we have some flexibility in the standpoint of the type of business for ag production. Um, our REIT program, you do not have to be located in a, in a rural area. So all REIT funds are eligible for um, ag producers. Um, for um, our business and industry, um, your program, your project can be located in a rural area, but your business doesn't necessarily need to be headquartered in a rural area. So it opens up the breath a little bit of what's considered um, applicable. Um, but again, we have some um, some um, opportunities to kind of expand our eligibility criteria. Uh, one of them is for REIT for ag production, and the other one is for healthy food uh, for business and industry um, that are not restricted to rural. Next slide, please. And I'll talk about both of those programs um, on the guaranteed loan side. So our business and industry might be considered our flagship loan program within RBS. Um, it is designed to improve development or finance um, industry and employment, um, as well as economic, um, environmental, and climate conditions um, in rural communities. Um, again, this is not necessarily a loan for substandard or marginal um, loans. There are programs that are out there that are, yeah, you can have no other commercial lender, but this is not necessarily, this is not one of them. Um, and so uh, we have competitive rates and those rates are being, are able to be negotiated between the lender and the borrower. Next slide, please. This particular program has probably the largest breadth of, of our programs um, within RBS. Um, you are able to use it for purchase of uh, real estate, land, buildings, um, industrial projects, properties. Um, you, can, you can actually acquire other businesses, do some expansions, modernizations, as well as conversions. Um, you are able to get machinery and equipment, uh, working capital, um, processing facilities, you're able to generate um, energy under certain applicable conditions, as well as um, some debt refinancing. So it has a really large breadth of the type of um, uses that are approved. Again, this particular program, the BNI, um, is not restricted to uh, small businesses. Um, so any business that is located in a rural area, and again, the manufacturing facility or other facility does not have to be headquartered in a rural area, um, but the project. So let's say in the manufacturing facility would need to be located in a rural area. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for, I'll pivot back into our Rural Energy for America program. Um, so it, apparently this is the, the loan side. Um, we have a maximum of 25 million for our grant. Again, the same eligible purposes, um, energy efficiency improvements, as well as renewable energy system installations, um, minimum loan amount of 5,000, maximum of 25 million. Um, and again, we are only able, able to do 25% of total eligible project cost. Um, now, it's interesting because our guaranteed loan programs, this particular one, um, can actually be uh, coupled with another guaranteed loan program. So you are able to couple uh, the REAP with business and industry as well as SBA. So, um, and to help meet that additional 25% equity requirement. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is kind of just a mention. Um, typically, we have a 10 million uh, standard for our loan amounts. Um, however, uh, our our maximum loans for our business and industry, and again, our REAP, are 25 million. Um, and then we actually are able to go a little bit higher, 40 million for our rural cooperative organizations. So if there are any co-ops on the line, um, you are probably aware of that. Um, so again, um, our, our um, loans can be actually combined to maximize the guarantee amounts and reduce the equity requirements. Again, I mentioned the BNI can be coupled with REAP. It could also be coupled with SBA. Um, if there's any, um, from an ag perspective, we could also work with FSA, which is the Farm Service Agency. They also have loans, um, and those can be mirrored together as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to kind of paint the numbers, um, in FY18, um, BNI closed 340 um, six loans um, obligated about $1.2 billion. Um, so again, um, we have an appropriations of $1.2 billion. So this is the largest program that we have in the standpoint of funding at RBS. Next slide, please. Um, our renewable um, biorefinery, renewable chemical and bio-based product manufacturing assistance program um, is a, a program that supports 
um, integrated demonstration units for emerging technologies to full-scale commercialization. Um, you can produce an advanced biofuel, a bio-based product, or a renewable chemical, um, or any combination thereof. Um, and so the maximum guaranteed for this is $250 million. Um, it's a pretty lengthy process in the standpoint of um, the type of um, the application process. It's done in two phases. Um, phase one um, is done, you need basically a um, feasibility study, um, some marketing materials. You need to have your lender together. We can talk offline if there's somebody that's very interested in this. Um, however, we have two different application cycles for this particular program. program. Um, April 1st, as well as October 1. Um, and so if anybody's interested, I can definitely um, provide some additional details, um, but it's a pretty good program. Um, I would say from a manufacturing perspective, you're really talking about more bio-based product manufacturing, which could also be used as an intermediary. So you don't necessarily have to manufacture said product. It could be manufacturing an intermediary is gonna be used into another process. Um, let's say a, um, or maybe a bio-based um, plastic or a bio-based straw. Um, and so you could be using the uh, the resin um, and manufacturing essentially that. So um, there is a lot of opportunity that's for this particular program. Next slide, please. Um, we also have an intermediary relending program. Again, I was really thinking with this particular slide about um, wastewater treatment facilities. Um, essentially, what this program does is provide a low interest loan uh, to local lenders or intermediary intermediaries that will relend. Um, to businesses to improve economic conditions. And so um, this could actually be used for both um, wastewater treatment facilities as well as manufacturing facilities. Um, and so in sake of um, time, I'm not gonna go through all of this slide, um, but I do think that it's a really good program and it provides um, some, you know, some additional funds and access and capital depending on where these particular businesses are located. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is a little bit more information about the, uh, the relending program um, and again, uh, being able to apply for an intermediary. So again, for the sake of time, because we were getting pretty close, I'm going to just bypass this. Next slide, please. Uh, community facilities. Um, so community facilities is actually a grant and loan program. I'm gonna, really gonna talk about the guaranteed loan component. Um, it is essentially a community facility that provides essential services to the local community and a rural area. Again, I was really thinking along this line for the wastewater treatment facilities. Um, it, and so this program has a little bit of a different definition for rural. Um, the guaranteed loan program um, is for designated places of population 50,000 or less. However, um, they use a little bit smaller designation for direct loans and grants, which is 20,000 or less. Um, eligible borrowers include public bodies, community-based nonprofit corporations, as well as uh, federally recognized tribes. Um, and it has a wonderful breadth of the types of things that it can fund. Um, and so I wanted to mention this because it really um, provides um, a very good snapshot on the standpoint of the types of um, resources that are available um, through the USDA, um, but it could be used to purchase, construct, improve essential community facilities, purchase equipment, um, pay for related project expenses. Um, it does not have a maximum on the guaranteed loan amount either. Um, so it is really a fantastic program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to mention really looking at kind of in the standpoint of leveraging and real and recognizing what types of resources are available, really looking at leveraging the RBS um, programs with incentives and tax credits. Um, there's a lot of different types of investment incentives and tax credits that can be used in tandem with our program. Um, these include but are not limited to opportunity zones, um, new market tax credits, investment tax credits, carbon capture tax credit, um, state energy programs, um, and other tax credits, as well as secondary market sales and revenue. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I think most people are aware that there has been opportunity zones um, that will reduce your tax equity uh, or the no tax on the capital gains. Um, and so I'm not an expert in opportunity zones, but I know that if you're, depending on where your project is located, that might be uh, some um, a creative mechanism to really looking at um, the uh, increasing um, or making it, you know, making the business case. And so um, there's a lot of different things that can be done from a, from a tax perspective or leveraging additional resources, not also within your state. Um, and so in addition, you're able to sell our um, guarantees in the secondary market, not you, but the lender is. So that might also be um, a selling point when you're potentially talking to lenders um, on why they should be participating in uh, USDA guarantee loans program. 
Uh, next slide, please. So um, qualified opportunity zones, this is just a, uh, a map. And I will make mention that 40% of opportunity zones are located in rural areas. So it's worthwhile to kind of take a look. And I'm, I, a picture's worth a thousand words. So I always like to throw the map out there to say, here, here's what's potentially available. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to just give a couple very quick um, examples and success stories. Um, we were able to do a rural electric cooperative um, utilizing um, a $13,000 rebrand uh, for efficiency um, of glass roof, radiant heat, um, bands, vents, and some computerized controls re um, resulting in 66% reduction in energy cost. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have a guaranteed loan that's reaped um, that Merrill Manufacturing was um, able to utilize um, the purchase and installation of energy efficiency heating and cooling system, um, resulting in a reduction of their energy cost. Um, next slide, please. And we've got one business industry loan guarantee um, that was a business in Ohio. Um, they were able to purchase a high pass air compressor system um, to improve the efficiency of their drillers operation, um, a little over $2 million in total project cost. Um, and the lender is by line bank. Next slide, please. Um, so here's if you have any additional information, um, feel free to uh, check us out at um, our website. Um, as well as if you're interested in looking at our USDA investment map and you're able to search by um, location as well as different types of uh, programs from the efficiency perspective. Um, so we have lots of, um, and you're able also to look at maybe if you're interested in incorporating solar into your operation, who's been doing solar in your area. So it's a really fantastic resource. Um, here's my contact information. I would also say, um, and I didn't mention this before, but I think it's important, um, kind of piggybacking off of the last, um, the last presenter. Um, if you're interested, our first step for rural development, we have 47 different state state offices. Um, so oftentimes your state um, rural development office is your first step. Um, and so you are able to access your state resources through this website too, um, but it's always a good step. But if you have questions or need some additional information, feel free to contact me and we can walk you through that step. So that's all I have, Eli. Wow, uh, Venus, that was really great. I uh, every time uh, I start to feel like, you know, the Department of Energy is your one-stop shop for uh, helping you with your energy uh, management needs, a, the webinar like this comes around and I feel like we are just one small piece of the pie of how the federal government is looking to help people. So I am, uh, uh, I, I have a lot of homework to go back and, you know, really familiarize myself with a lot of these resources. Um, uh, so again, if folks, we have a, maybe three minutes or so until we should wrap up here but if folks have questions please uh submit them um one question that i saw come in was that you you may have addressed just now uh concerned you know if i'm trying to figure out which of these programs is right for me is there a central place where i can compare and contrast them or uh understand or is it best off for me just to call my state uh my, my USDA state energy office to, to talk through with someone and then, you know, describe my, describe my business and understand how, uh, uh, how, you know, how one of these might make sense for me. Um, so <laughs> that's a loaded question. Uh, yes, there are resources that we'll kind of go through um, on our website for businesses, um, more that are energy focused. Um, you can also reach out to your state um, energy coordinator and kind of talk to them. You can also reach out to me um, and kind of walk them through your state, where you're located, what you're interested in doing. Um, sometimes it's really easy when you have somebody that understands kind of the 30,000 foot perspective. Um, and it's hard in the federal government. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but there's a lot of different resources. Um, and we're here to support. So we're happy to help. So I would say um, it would be helpful. What state does this person? Well, they can reach out to me and tell me what yeah. state they're in. Um, and we could kind of go from there. So, um, but again, feel free to reach out to your state resources. They're often the first step. Um, so whatever you're feeling comfortable with. Um, Great. And, and one last question, Venus, before, uh, before we have to let you go. Um, there were a few of the programs, or at least one of the programs that uh, I saw that where you specified the, the application dates. There was an April 1st application date and then a, a later one. 
Uh, for the other programs, if you didn't specify, should we just assume it's a rolling application period and uh, that funds, you know, yes. that it's available until uh, funds expire? I, yes, I apologize. So our guaranteed loan programs are all rolling application deadlines. We accept them year round. We actually have a competition on a monthly basis. Um, so there is something that's, that's perpetually cycling all the time. I will also note if anyone is interested in the guaranteed loan component that doesn't necessarily, um, because it's a lender driven program, we are happy to hop on the phone with you and, and talk to a lender, a potential lender um, on what that looks like. Um, we often say that it's probably easier to work with somebody you're already working with. However, we also have a, additional lenders that you know that we do business with we can't necessarily promote any particular bank however we're happy to kind of um, help you kind of steer and navigate that particular process um, especially if they're new to the guaranteed loan world oh, fantastic that's uh that's great venus thanks so much um well we have your contact information up there and we'll you know the slides will be available for everyone uh to go back and uh you know, we've recorded this webinar, so if there's anything you missed or wanted to review again, we'll be sharing that with everyone on, on our website. Um, so, uh, Marissa, are there any next slides? Do we do in the past we have? I should have checked, but um, in case not, I, I want, yes, so this is our Better Building Solutions Center. Um, this is a reminder on how to use it and to, uh, leverage all of the, the resources that we have out there. There's a little mouse is doing this for me, um, which is which is really great. Um, and so should you want anything from our resources, please, uh, you know, we have all these wonderful solutions and technical resources that we hope uh, you will take advantage of. So please, uh, please do that. Um, otherwise, uh, next slide. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week where we uh, roll up our sleeves and dive deep into the, uh, the wonderful world of compressed air systems. Um, so thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, please register for the summit. You have all of our contact information for myself, Venus, Dave, um, and uh, as well as the team who run the webinar series, uh, you know, Marissa and Nina, thank you for your continued help. Um, and everyone enjoy your Thursday. Uh, stay safe out there. <laughs>